Okay, everyone. Welcome to the top 10 legal issues for Wikimedia. But before I dive into that, I'd like to introduce you to our team, the Legal and Community Ad Ad uh, Advocacy Department. Uh, what we have is a legal team that is really small for the fifth largest website in the world. Uh, we also fortunately have uh, a mascot, and that's Rory. Uh, now, if you can actually learn about our team on the staff and contractor page of the Wikimedia Foundation, and everyone uh, expresses their interest, including Rory, Rory has a special interest in wiki species uh, and animal rights. In addition to Rory, we have four lawyers, two community advocates, one paralegal. We actually bring in interns from top law schools such as Harvard and Stanford uh, to um, support us. Kelly and I, Kelly's my deputy general counsel, we have about somewhere between 15 and 20 years of international internet experience. Mu much of our work on a day-to-day -day basis has nothing to do with U.S. law. We're very, uh, we both have practiced in Europe. Uh, Kelly has practiced in Asia. Uh, we've both been responsible for global legal teams. The, um, we also work with a very strong network of lawyers internationally on a, a daily basis. And all that is really important. But what's really uh, essential for us to be able to do our job with such a small team, with such a large site, is the community. And you're going to be hearing a few themes in my presentation as to the importance of the community in ensuring that we have a secure and safe site. So issue number one is trademarks. Trademarks are extremely valuable symbols that we have to represent our movement, and they are worth millions of dollars, literally. Next slide. They're important because of you, the community. These trademarks reflect the work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis. It represents the value of your edits, of your uh, photographs. With these particular trademarks, it represents the goodwill that is expressed internationally throughout all the sites, through many different countries, in many different languages. And we want to make sure that we're using them in a way that's consistent with the mission. Next slide. We want to make sure that people are not misusing those uh, uh, marks to misrepresent the values that you're working for. So in June, by uh, alone, as one example, there were 20, uh, 20 uh, examples of improper Wikimedia trademarks, and two of them are on this slide. The first is Wikipedia Top Gear. That was a fake page that was trying to mimic a Wikipedia article, but it was entirely an ad for an arguably very questionable company. The other example is Wikipedia, Encyclopedia of Excitement. That sounds really great, except it's a fake page that also mimics an article and actually offers a method that supposedly allows one to win at roulette. <laughs> um, unfortunately, it also links to very questionable um, uh, sites that uh, do not at all represent our movement. One of the most important things about our community is that you are out there as a vigilance of our marks. When you see a mark that is being misused, please report it to us, and I know you do. How could a company, a regular for-profit company, do better? Uh, they would have to hire 100,000 people to be watching out for their marks. But boy, I have the luxury of knowing you're out there watching for us. So let us know about it. Next slide. We do have to protect our marks. We have to follow international laws to do so. Uh, last year alone, we spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to develop our trademark portfolio. And we do it in a number of different ways. We register them globally, strategically. We've um, expanded uh, throughout the world. We're constantly building. We are uh, uh, every day sending out cease and desist letters against those who are misusing our marks. We file defensive oppositions against registrations where people are trying to register our marks across the world. We've hired one of the best brand protection firms, Mark Monitor, to help us um, look for unauthorized uses. 
Last year, we actually were able to negotiate 1,000 blocks of squatters who were misusing uh, variations of our domain name. We actually file complaints, and we have done so this year with WIPO against domain name squatters, and we have won every case that we have filed. We negotiate the transfer of domain names, not just for the foundation, but we have helped uh, on a consistent basis the chapters in helping them get the domain names that they actually have to have. But we can't do everything. I actually am in charge of a legal department for a nonprofit foundation. My budget is limited. If I want to file a registration for a trademark just in the United States, it's going to cost me around $4,000. I can take advantage of something that's called the Madrid Protocol. That allows us to register trademarks across a number of different other countries, but it's, that still costs around $35,000. And it doesn't cover countries where we have an interest as a movement, such as India and Brazil. I have to pay more money out of my budget for that. And that's only just for one mark. So it's a very expensive uh, process. Filing a WIPO complaint can cost us three to $5,000. The key here is strategy. The key here is to build your trademark portfolio and, uh, on a solid foundation. And I'm very grateful to have a team that knows how to do that. Next slide. Licensing the trademark is extremely important also. We want to make sure that uh, people are using our trademark in a way consistent with our mission. We have every year approximately 200 license um, uh, requests, um, and Michelle is actually writing uh, licenses on an ongoing basis uh, to make sure that the community can use our marks in ways that are creative, and also to allow um, a proper portrayals of what we are about by companies, including the entertainment business. One of Michelle's jobs is to actually read movie scripts to make sure that the context of a Wikipedia screen that's being showed dur uh, during uh, in the cinema is actually reflects the values that we um, represent. Sometimes Michelle actually uh, will uh, act some of the parts um, in the <laughs> script, um, but every job does have its drawbacks. Um, <laughs> next. Issue number two, copyright. Boy, this community is extremely well versed in copyright. <laughs> and you know, it actually makes sense because every editor, every photographer in this room is a rights owner. But you've made a decision that's different from big media. You've decided to take your rights and actually freely license them globally. And so it's no wonder that we have discussions over the most sophisticated uh, nuances of copyright law. And because of you, I don't have to have a, a law firm of 300 lawyers to understand the nuances of copyright law. How many DMCA takedown notices, the official legal request to take down content, does the fifth largest website in the world receive every year? Google received two million in one month, we received 10. Now, why is that? It's because you guys are doing an incredible job at understanding copyright and taking down content which is actually illegal and actually defending the content that needs to be kept up. It's pretty amazing and I'm very grateful to have your support. Issue number three, biographies of living persons. We spend a lot of time in the legal department on biographies of living persons. They are contentious, they're often vandalized, they're used for self-promotion. People do not like unflattering things said about them, so they come up with re legal claims like defamation, privacy, or some sort of legal um, construction which really is simply a simple wish not to have unflattering but true things being said about you. Uh, we are highly successful in defending this. We are doing this on a day-to-day -day basis, protecting the content that the community has put up. Uh, we receive approximately 200 requests by lawyers, uh, serious requests to take down content, and we successfully push back 95% uh, of the time defending the community's uh, content. And we do not hesitate to litigate and to defend. I will hire the best lawyers um, that we know to go into international courtrooms and defend content, and we're doing that and managing that litigation on an ongoing basis. Um, I know that when that certain DCMA takedowns um, are published are publicized, Maggie Denon puts up notices in certain places. Um, for these content takedowns, are you also able to give us notices? Because 
because um, the strike sand, um, the strike sand effect is a powerful weapon that we should be willing to use to make these people, well, to sound more vindictive than I want, pay to fucking. So we um, really don't take down unless there's a DMCA notice. Uh, there may be times when there's a, a complaint that comes in and we'll um, bring it to the attention of the community and the community will say that's not consistent with our policy on biographies of living persons. But generally we don't take down. We will notify if we take down. Uh, we had an instance in Germany where there was a takedown. We were ha actually had a uh, community discussion in the Loriot case. Um, and so I think we're, we feel, as a legal department, we need to be transparent when we take things down. Well, what, what I'm asking is, are you able to tell us who's sending you requests? Uh, yeah. You, you are. Yeah, we, we do do that. Um, we are, we're not doing that. Oh, you're talking about the 95%. Yeah. Yeah, we're not doing it, and we're not doing it because of resource um, issues. Um, we're four attorneys. Um, and so it's, uh, we're, we're receiving requests on a daily basis. We're talking internally about doing something similar to what Google has done on transparency on the request. I think we th think that's very successful. Um, and so we'll go, uh, we um, are considering it, but it is a resource issue for us. Yes? Uh, just really quick, you said you received 200 um, notifications related to the biography and living persons. Biographies and other copyright issues, yes. Over what period of time? Yep, two million in a month. In a month? According to um, reports, yeah. So thanks for doing the uh, 1.99999 um, million requests for us um, every month. Um, the next issue. So I say new terms of use, but what I'm actually saying is we're giving a lot of thought as to how we talk to the community about very important documents that affect um, us as a movement. The new terms of use rolled out. It was a publicly negotiated uh, It was publicly negotiated with the community. I'd like to think it was the most visibly negotiated terms of use for any major website ever. Uh, the community raised, discussed over 120 different issues. Uh, the uh, number of words for the discussion were more than the novel of the Grapes of Wrath, <laughs> and I think that what the uh, what I found was extremely helpful to me as a general counsel to understand what the community wanted. The document that went in was not the document that um, the board approved, and it was because of active and very thoughtful uh, considerations by the community. And it's a model, and it's a model for other documents we're thinking about, and one of them is going to be the privacy document. Next one, Stephen. Yeah. Um, so you should care because, uh, first of all, one of the things we did with the terms of use, and this is a community idea, was to have a summary up front so it doesn't read completely like a legal document. Uh, and so uh, it gives you sort of an idea of sort of what are the rules of engagement for the movement itself. And that's why it was extremely value, uh, valuable to incorporate uh, the uh, community's thoughts in that area. But you should also care because editors have liability. And they should be told that. And the terms of use explains that to you and what the expectations are. One of the things when I came into this um, position was, um, and this is not a critique of any predecessors. You know, my world's different. I have a bigger budget and things like that. But one of the things as we got bigger is I wanted to make sure that people understood where we, where we are. And the terms of use is a way to be able to do that. I think we have a, re uh, it's one of our values is transparency. And so we need to be able to communicate that instead of just leaving people in the dark. Do we know how many people um, act Yeah, actually we had, an, uh, we had a stat at one time as how many people were clicking through, but I don't have those numbers. Okay. Okay, great. So privacy. There are two things about privacy. First you have to have a set of rules, and then you've got to obey the rules. Okay, our first set of rules is the privacy policy, and we do have one in place, and it's okay, but it needs to be updated. There have been many changes, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. And we, there have been changes in technology and how uh, actually what the expectations are. We have, a, um, we have values here in our community. Privacy is a legal mandate, but more importantly, it's a community value. And the foundation stands as a steward for those particular values. 
So I want to make sure that we understand what those rules are and that we are best in class. And you will, in a few months, uh, within the next few months, uh, see a draft of a new version of the privacy policy. And we're going to be putting it out there and hopefully having discussions over a period of months with the community on that. I think the challenge for me that I like to do better than what I did with the terms of use is I like to make it even more international. And so we're going to figure out how can we do translations of um, summaries so those who don't speak English actually understand what's going on. As I say, the rules are fine. We're going to go and update those rules. But just having a policy is not good enough. You've got to put the systems behind it. And our legal department is thinking on a daily basis out to make sure that not only the community understands the responsibilities, but that our staff does as well. And so we do that uh, uh, from a, as a service from the legal department. Issue number six. OK, someone guessed this sort of right. Um, we do think a lot about, I say post-blackout, what to do now. Um, what I'm really saying is we have to think about what is our role on legislative um, issues. Now, I'm not going to go into detail. There are other people who are giving much better presentations than mine on sort of what happened and what we should do from a policy, policy standpoint. But let me talk about a few things I think about as the general counsel. The first is you've got to comply with lobbying restrictions on nonprofits. For WMF, that means we have to think about not only the federal laws, but also the state laws. So for the New York and the Washington chapters, don't just think federal, think state if you're ever doing anything. Uh, the other thing is uh, the chapters internationally have to comply with their own country laws. And they may define lobbying in a completely different way, and there may be different uh, requirements. So don't forget about that if you get involved in this area. My personal belief is this does not work unless the community is front and center on any decisions in legislative activities. The, and then the question becomes for me is how do we inform the community on legal uh, nuances that may be in place. With SOFA, we did hire a government consultant. He was able to tell us the status of particular bills, when amendments were coming down, what the, the significance of the amendments were, when hearings were being um, scheduled, and I was hopefully able to effectively to convey that to the community during the SOFA blackout. We, I also wrote a blog. We have members on our team who wrote summaries of not only SOPA, but other, um, uh, other bills such as OPEN. So I think uh, figuring out how we inform the community so that they can be effective if they decide to go this way. Now, I will not hide. Um, I'm not a personal fan of getting overly involved in legislative um, matters. I, my view is it's a little off mission. But my role is, that makes that somewhat irrelevant, because my role is to execute um, the will of the foundation which listens to the community. Um, so I have to think about these things. But one of the things that did happen to us after SOPA uh, was we got, started getting many political requests. Well, can you sign this petition? Can you start becoming part of this organization? And that's made me realize that we have to have a policy, not, not one that will ap apply to Russia or to the community, uh, efforts, but one that applies to the foundation. When does the foundation sign up, uh, assign a petition? When do they become a member of an organization? So we are actually drafting now a policy that says, that does two things. First, what you cannot do. Okay, under the law, you cannot support a, polit uh, a politician. So you can't do that in the policy. The other thing is, we can't really be, uh, the other prohibition is, let's not be doing things that are contrary to our mission. So I actually love animals, but I don't believe we should be putting um, uh, anti-animal cruelty banners on our site. Um, I may be anti-war, but I don't necessarily think we should be using our assets for that particular cause. Um, I think we should be thinking about um, issues of free expression and issues of uh, free licensing, for example. So that's one thing that this policy that we're drafting does. The other thing is, how is a decision made and who should be consulted? There are definitely people within the staff. I should know because there are legal implications um, and there may be some other people. Okay, five minutes and I'm on number six. Um, but anyhow, the most important thing about this policy is when do we go to the community? And uh, we recently had this happen. Uh, in the Internet Defense League, a newly formed political organization, wanted us to sign up along with Creative Commons and Mozilla. 
And we, um, I said, no, I want to hear what the community has to say about it. So we did an RFC, which closed uh, last week, I think, or week before last. And it was a resounding no, we do not want to be part of this. And there were a number of reasons. Proposal was a little vague. People had uh, felt that it was a little too uh, political for our movement. I'm thinking about creating a political policy advisory group that I can throw ideas out to. Uh, to, like, do, should we be thinking about signing this petition? Please give me advice on how I should interact with the community on that. And people who are interested in that should sign up, and we'll be doing that shortly. I've decided I do not want to hire someone who has expertise in legislative affairs. I think that that's because it's to, uh, it to do it effectively, you have to be an expert. You have to have experience. If I hire one person, they will only be U.S.-oriented. I don't think that's good enough. Uh, what I do think about is uh, actually petitioning for grants to support organizations that support values of free expression, open source, free licensing, because they may be much better at us than we can be. Uh, public knowledge is an example, and I would definitely want to focus on organizations in Europe that do the same thing. So instead of maybe becoming the experts ourselves, we should start thinking about how do we use our money to support um, established experts. Okay, number seven. Um, Okay, I'm going to make this, abbreviate this. Um, jurisdiction's important, and why is it important? Because it tells us what laws applies, and that's important because it tells us what content is illegal. Um, it also tell, um, and so our position is that U.S. law applies, and because of that, we do a lot of things from a, uh, from a point of view from the legal uh, side. Our contracts uh, reflect this. How we structure things as an organization reflect that to support um, the position that it's U.S. law that applies. And there are good reasons for it. It's not only the First Amendment that applies, but we have very strong safe harbor provisions that the courts are continue to ratify. And also, a little known fact is that uh, in the United States, federal courts will not enforce uh, foreign defamation uh, judgments, which are really free expression judgments, unless um, those judgments reflect the values of the, uh, of the First Amendment and reflect the values of safe harbor under U.S. law. Issue number eight. Oh, contracts. He's going to talk about contracts. That's really boring. <laughs> um, and yet it's what we do day in and day out. We have over 200 contracts um, a year that we review. Uh, that we approve and that we often have to negotiate and some of them are extremely sophisticated. I'm fortunate to have a team who's extra, uh, very talented and very experienced in this area. But contracts is also about community values. Co we use contracts to protect your data and donor data. We use contracts to protect our trademarks as I earlier uh, spoke on. We ensure that um, our service providers uh, understand or are observing the terms of our free licenses. Um, and also, let's just remember that every dollar that we spend on a service provider is a dollar out of the wallet of a donor. And so our contracts make sure that we're getting the biggest bang for the buck. And we spend lots of time on it. Doesn't grab headlines, but extremely important to our mission. Um, the next uh, issue is number nine. I call it legal wiki. One of the things I've been thinking about is how do we communicate some of our legal concepts with the community more effectively. One way we did it was the, was the user agreement. I hope um, we'll be able to do it successfully with the privacy policy. But oftentimes, you guys are like incredible experts. I mean, you may, be, you may have experience and specialized knowledge on monuments in France during a certain time period. Okay, they didn't teach me that in law school. You guys are better at that than I am. But sometimes you come up with questions where you need more guidance. And how should I do that? Now, technically, I can't give you legal advice. I'm not your personal attorneys, right? I represent the foundation. Fortunately, the foundation has a mission to support the community. And so I need to figure out um, how to be able to give guidance to the community. And what we've come up with is something called Legal Wiki this year. And I'm fortunate uh, to, we have 500 applications from law students from all over the country to come in every semester to work with us as interns. And we're able to really pick some great people. And Michelle has done a great job putting that program together. 
those guys um, are able to uh, do initial drafts of very detailed legal research that we think we're providing as a possible guidance uh, as we discuss a particular issue. And so we have 17 online now. The um, address is there. Uh, we're churning out about three a month. Uh, and we're going to actually blog on it because I, I want to get Sweat of the Brow in. I also want to um, get um, Ride to Pan Panorama in. Uh, but these are not these are not to be, these are not etched in stone. You can think of them as really super sophisticated stubs um, that you guys can go in and change. And there's no reason if we get it wrong that you say you got it wrong and you put it right. There's no reason that if we are um, too U.S. centric on something, you also put in the French point of view. So that's nine. Trying to figure out how to communicate better, and Legal Wiki is our first attempt on that, in, or one of our attempts. Number ten. <coughs> Okay, I'm not committing to anything I'm about to say, <laughs> but I want you to say I want you to know that we're thinking about it very closely, and we're doing it uh, in conjunction with Garfield. What we want to do is um, figure out a way that we can put together a defense fund for administrators and functionaries. Now we haven't seen any major, we haven't seen actually any legal issues um, along those lines, but some people are expressing anxiety. Uh, that uh, what happens, what if cases. And we want to show our support to the community. And so what this defense fund would do is it would pay for attorney's fees if, you know, uh, indeed uh, there was a lawsuit and there never has been, um, at least under my watch. And I think it's going to be uh, sort of a good message to the community uh, that we really care about the work you guys are doing. Uh, it will be discretionary, there will be ceilings, it will only be paying for legal fees, so there will be limits on it. What I expect to happen, we're now drafting the policy, uh, we're working out some financial things. Um, I hope to be able to share that with the community, and if it makes sense to people, we, we would uh, take it to the board. So those are the top ten legal things, uh, legal, well, legal issues um, that we're dealing with. We're dealing with a lot more. I'd like to take this public venue as an opportunity to frankly acknowledge and thank my team. I am extremely uh, grateful to have such a talented group supporting me. And I also want to say at the same time, when I say my team, I mean every one of you here. Um, I would have to have a law firm of 300 people as lawyers, as I've said, in order to do my job right if you weren't part of this. And frankly, we would not, even with that, we would not do it as well as you guys. So thank you very much. Freedom, I said right, you're right, freedom of panorama. Right? Yeah, so, and um, I, uh, you know, take a lot of, from what I do, I take a lot of pictures of historic buildings, and I think everybody else in the National Register Library and Museum does this a lot, has, we share these stories. We've all had a couple of times we've been confronted about taking pictures of publicly viewable buildings. Has the foundation ever received any, or have you ever received any requests to take down pictures, not of a person or something, but of a house, out of, out of, out of privacy concerns? So I know of none, and Michelle is, uh, is the expert though? Um, it, and it wasn't really, they claimed it was a privacy issue. Um, essentially, it was a. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle. Um, so, the one issue that we have had uh, had to do with a private residence, and they claimed that it was invading their personal privacy, etc. But when I looked at it, it was actually a part of a rather large residence, um, and it was specifically, I believe, Watts, Watkins Pond, um, which they had made into a tourist attraction, and it was by no means private. Um, and I refused to take down on those arguments, essentially, um, if they had any claim at all, because they said that they had no photography signs everywhere, um, they made everyone agree, they told them, and at best they had a breach of contract with the photographer, not with the foundation, um, so we refused to take Marcus, I see you're ready to go, and I don't see any other hands, so thank you. I'm sorry for the uh, going over a little bit. Um, okay, hello. Good morning. Um, I'm glad that so many of you came um, to uh, our session, to this talk. Um, I'm Marcus Glaser. Uh, I 
represent uh, Wikimedia Germany, but not in this talk. In this talk, I'm just a private person, um, which is mainly because I uh, submitted the talk before I was officially elected <laughs> in some position at the <laughs> Wikimedia Germany. Um, okay, so my question here is, uh, do editors have a right on privacy? So uh, as you might assume, um, that talk is basically about privacy. Um, but um, I'm, I will not talk about, thank you. <laughs> I will not talk about um, collecting data so much, but more about how uh, our attitude as editors is towards privacy of, of peers. Um, so uh, when we look at uh, Wikipedia editors, it might be something like this. I mean, this is a picture taken um, of the Carnival of Venice, and as you might know, that it's tradition there um, to put on uh, certain masks. Um, so what you're doing there is you're basically acting in public, in a public space, but you have masks on your face uh, is uh, so that other people don't recognize you. Um, I think the same kind of holds for the Wikimedia, Wikipedia community. So when we're talking about privacy of editors, anyone might just say, okay, hey, everybody knows Wikipedia is, is being edited in public, so what I write there, uh, what somebody writes there should be public, publicized. Uh, on the other hand, if you want, as an editor, if you want to have your privacy protected, you might as well just use a pseudonym, like putting up a mask, um, and basically, um, uh, that's it. So why do we need, why am I talking about an editor's privacy here um, as everything's uh, going to be public? Well, um, let's just take the case of pseudonyms. Why do you think is anyone um, using a pseudonym? Um, going on to the next slide. So um, who do you think, who, who, whom are we protecting against? Is it the Carnival of Venice those guys are protecting them against? As to the organizers of the car Carnival should not recognize who they are. Um, that in our case is protecting against Wikipedia as a platform. Um, I think that's one case, but that's not the, the, the main case. So are we protecting, are we using pseudonyms to protect our identities against other spectators of the carnival, in our case, are we protecting against other users? Here again, I should say, I think no, because um, within the platform, um, it does not really matter whether we use pseudonyms or real names. We have identities in the platform as the people in the carnival of Venice have masks. So um, the, the third um, option is, are we protecting against the outside world, but our personal connections? Um, would we not like to uh, see our friends, colleagues, whoever, um, uh, realize what we are editing, what we are doing on Wikipedia? And um, so my, my, my case is that this is the main case, the main reason for protecting. We are protecting against um, like the, the, the personal connections we have in the real world. Um, I realize that um, the situation in countries where there is heavy censorship might be different in this case. So um, my field of experience is the German, the English Wikipedia, where I um, assume this is the main reason, like people using pseudonyms, because they want to edit heavy porn, sadomasochism, or whatever, and don't want their colleagues see that they do these edits. Okay. Um, does, does the personal connection still count for enemies, i.e. There is a set number of very screwed up people who, many of whom have been banned from the project, who spend their time trying to figure out who, what the real life identity of the pseudonym is, and then ruin their real life by harassing them at work, harassing them at home, harassing their family, that kind of thing. Yeah, I should think so. So, um, I mean, w we're not talking about some play field. Uh, protecting the privacy of a person is a real issue, and uh, it protects their... Uh, sometimes their the personal and their the physical integrity. So, um, yeah, we, we're talking about serious things here. And, you know, there, there, there have been lawsuits. Um, I was involved with, with five of them uh, pertaining to my editing of Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. So, and I got a little 
lawyer and spent eight months dealing with legal attacks from a number of people around the world. I won, but, but yeah. Okay. So, but I, I'm very open about my name, but, but there are drawbacks to being open, and one is you do expose yourself to legal attacks. Yes, that's, um, I agree. So, um, uh, well, another question has to be mm -hmm. the public or the media and journalists, whether it's the that you use. Pardon? Uh, protection against the public or the media, yeah. Um, <coughs> that might be another case, um, although I would say it's, um, I would subsume it under the platform um, because it's, it's like, it's not within my personal connections, but it's, it's the infrastructure that society is kind of built on. Um, okay, so, but what, what really happens is that pseudonyms are not perfect. So I, I want to make three cases um, which, which show that this privacy is not um, protected in a way that I think it should be. Um, pseudonyms are not always perfect. So if you look closely at this guy, he's got glasses on and he's got a beard and with uh, like his, his physical um, with face recognition, I'm pretty sure um, in, uh, nowadays you could really find out who he is. Um, that also holds true for like the list of user contributions. Um, uh, uh, some story I was uh, researching into privacy and trying to find out what I w try to figure what I can find out about a pseudonym, which is a bit, bit of mean to do, but I, I, I tried it. Um, and I took one guy, um, this is the user contribution list of this guy from um, a German Wikipedia. And when you look at the edit profile, um, in this case, it, it, this guy did something on, on local sports. Um, he did a bit of um, editing on uh, social topics like labor unions and uh, um, yeah, direct democracy, such things. Um, he mainly corrected uh, typos. Um, and he had uh, an entry, he modified an entry of a specific school in Germany. So it wasn't really s that hard to track him down, to, to, to identify this guy as a teacher in that particular school with a particular set of uh, subjects he's teaching. And uh, I could narrow down the names uh, from um, uh, unlimited to two, basically, just by looking at the edit profile of that person. Um, I think this, he, th th this, guy was not particular about his privacy, so, um, but he used a pseudonym on Wikipedia and there was no direct link between the pseudonym on, and, and the real name anywhere on the web. But just by looking at the um, contributions list, I could identify this guy and I'm pretty sure um, I basically got him. Um, <coughs> okay, um, what I find more, um, uh, well, uh, 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 more dangerous is um, because in this case, in the case of the user contributions list, um, you are basically in charge of what you're editing as an editor. So um, you might use a different pseudonym for another um, set of topics or whatever, um, not edit uh, the place where you live um, as not to give cues or so. Um, in, in the next case, um, this is a detail of the um, picture we've seen before. Um, others, and especially people, that's why I, I um, insisted on the personal connection before, um, people that know you might add personal details of you on the page, like on a talk, talk page, um, that you are not willing to give away. Um, that's basically what we find on other social networks, like Facebook, um, all the time. But I think it can also be found on Wikipedia. Um, so here, you completely lose control. If we as a community of editors are not aware of this issue, um, I think uh, there's a danger of um, involuntarily or, um, yeah, uh, or on purpose, um, relief in some personal details of people that they don't want uh, on, on the pages. Also, of course, um, uh, there's the danger of um, like legal things like injury, but um, I think we could act against the legal part of it, but we cannot, cannot act against the privacy violation part of it. 
in a legal case. So um, I don't know if this is a really good example. I, I tried to find some examples for this yesterday. Um, this is from a an, an DSYSOP um, discussion. Um, and if you, if you read through this, uh, just skim it. Um, you see some words which I don't, I would not like to be connected to my identity, be it real or be it a pseudonym, right? So once it's put on a talk page, you can find it. And um, this uh, pseudonym will be forever connected with the word pedophilia. Um, I'm not sure in this case, that, that's what I said. Um, uh, if anybody knows this particular case, um, I'd be happy to, uh, um, <laughs> to have comments by you. But um, yeah. I actually do know it because I'm a member of the arbitration committee that okay. <laughs> this relates to. Uh, and this editor has long been associated with pedophilia. As a matter of fact, uh, he was the initially in 2006. In 2006. And then again, and and yeah. That's, that's what I uh, somehow found out. Um, uh, still, there's something in public written about him now, and um, even others, like now the um, real enemies, like the infrastructure enemies, like press. Um, uh, I, I, enemy is a hard word, so don't take me um, a verbatim on this. Um, they can, yeah, they, they, they can pick it up. Um, okay, so my last question on this was, um, so how can we just um, get rid of um, of those unwanted details? Um, and um, if you look at, at Wikipedia, as opposed to other um, social media platforms, it's, uh, as I think, extremely hard to get rid of, um, say, revisions, for example, that um, contain uh, privacy violations, especially, yeah, Yeah, I, I you are, you're also warned before you enter into an IT issue. But then again, if you take my, 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 my question about other people talking about you, um, no warning helps uh, whatsoever um, because it's not in the scope of your control. So what um, I was thinking of is can we figure a way, and, and um, that's basically an open question, um, to uh, give the user in question some, some kind of control over what's written um, uh, uh, what's written about him, um, as opposed to, b in, in the case of public uh, people, um, as you man mentioned, um, I think there are special laws for this and, and you can file legal suits and, and, and ask uh, uh, some facts to be taken down. In this case of, of us being editors, we're not people of public interest, I think that's the term, right? Or something like this. In, in, I'm translating the German term, public affairs. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it's not so easy just to, to have anybody taken uh, offensive material off Wikipedia. Um, um, there's there's um, a personal rule that I go by and don't know the rules of, which is essentially once something is on the internet, it never goes away no matter how hard you try. Um, and all the mechanisms that Wikipedia has for trying to hide people's personal information don't work for, for multiple reasons. One, I mean, short of <laughs> oversighting, um, you can move things around, um, but but that causes problems. Um, there's people like me watch when when users are put through the banishing system because the banishing system is frequently abused. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually can heighten um, the amount of attention you get. The um, Barbara Streisand effect. Yeah, well, yep. yes, the Streisand effect. If you make a big deal about it, I want you to delete it. Short of oversighting, there's no way to get rid of it on Wikipedia that that most people can't see. And even if you do get rid of it on Wikipedia, there are mirrors by the dozen. So you can't have it oversighted on back copies of, of the, the database dump or mirrors. So the only way you can ever protect yourself is by being very conscious of it ahead of time. Um, exactly. Um, so uh, that's kind of what I, I, I would agree. Um, I think that's a, a rather pessimistic view on this. Um, from a perspective of a uh, of an author, but it's probably one of the uh, it's probably the only one. Um, I have uh, just from personal experience, I tried to uh, research something uh, w that was written about me, 
in 2006. It's not on the Wikipedia, and um, I could not verify the law that the internet not forgets nothing. So I would um, uh, I would change the law and say the internet forgets nothing except you're looking for it specifically, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Um, th that is my experience. But um, yeah, um, <laughs> okay. Um, so I had. Yeah, I came up with, um, where's my mouse? Um, that's just some random thoughts, just edit the content, but then it's still in the history, as you said, there are mirrors. Ask for revision, deletion, which is a long uh, uh, long process. A lot of people talk about it. You might get the Barbara Streisand effect. Um, in a s very special case on the user talk page, you might just allow to um, the, the, the user whose talk page it is um, to delete a particular revision which would shortcut the process and as it is on the user stock page, this might be okay. But I guess most of the cases I'm talking about are in the admin uh, discussions, are in the banner, user ban discussions. So um, it, it doesn't really um, get a grip there. Um, maybe it, it might be possible to have some kind of emergency block um, like if I see it, I just hit a button and um, then it gets into the, the review process. But then again, as you said, you might get this Streisand effect. So what, what I think, I, I totally agree with you, is that we need to, um, we need to pledge on, on like awareness of, of all of us that this might be a problem and um, that we, um, we should be careful what we're writing about others and in discussions with others. Um, of course, last slide. <laughs> that that is a, an, a dangerous effect, and we don't want that. Um, so, um, if if anybody can come up with ideas, I'd be happy. Um, okay, open discussion for three minutes, I guess. <laughs> um, yes, please. Just last comment. Uh, not an idea, but just an additional comment. It's um, all the relationship that we have with user on OCRS. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when, when you have difficult um, OCRS discussions, sometimes it's helpful to use internet relay chat to create a private channel with only other people in OCRS, at which point you're able to consult with them openly. Um, it, OCRS doesn't mean that you can't talk to anyone, it only means you can't talk to people who aren't also cleared for access to their same lines. But we can at least talk to the people on OCRS because they already have access right. to fight, so they right. assume it's okay. The problem is more with the people on, on the Wikipedia project themselves who object to what we are trying to do because they can't see what is on the OCR. Um, do we have time for more questions? Uh, I guess we can take one more question before we move on to the next speaker. <laughs> okay. I really appreciate the opportunity to hear how, how things are working on other wikis because um, I do a lot of work involving the privacy issues on the English Wikipedia, and the first thing, you know, as I was looking at your list of options, I can tell you that almost all of them are in effect on the English Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. we, re we use revision deletion very heavily for privacy issues. Uh, we use suppression on a daily basis, easily. You know, we probably do 20 to 30 suppressions a day. So we do take it very seriously on, on English Wikipedia, but at the same time, there are effects that are almost the opposite. We do get an awful lot of Streisand effects, and perhaps the most frustrating for those who are doing the work, the uh, revision deletions and the suppressions, the oversighting team, 
we have people who insist on having something over suppressed because it is definitely personal information. There's no question about it. It's their home phone number or their address or something mm. clearly that doesn't belong on the wiki anyway. But then they do it again, and they put it up themselves, or they link to their blog that has their full name. <laughs> and I'm sorry, but there's a limit as to how much we can protect people from making themselves idiots. You know, that's, yeah. there's no other way to put it. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> you know, so that is a very frustrating aspect of it. So it has to be a two-way street. I agree with you, you know, and, and each project has to have their own rules about what is and isn't revision deletable and what's suppressible. It has to reflect the, the values of their own community because we really have some very, very different communities here. But at the same time, we need the users to respect the values of the community as well and to understand that if they're going to link to their personal information, even if it's not on our site, they, they've They've given that information up yeah. themselves, and we shouldn't be obliged as a community to be protecting them all the time. Um, of course, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Um, I, I I just want to to um, uh, state uh, to say that there are cases where this uh, putting up this information is beyond the control of the user, and that's where I think I the agree. user should be more enabled to act against. Um, Okay, thanks. So let's welcome Abhishek from MIT. Uh, hi everyone, thanks for showing up. Um, so uh, I'm an economist by day, um, and I care a lot about copyright. And so I know, and so does everyone here. And one of the things when I talk to non Wikipedians and and people like, hold on. People like this guy, uh, who's, uh, who's now deceased, but the ex-head of the Motion Picture Association, Jack Walenty, is that how, even if copyright's out of control, does it stifle innovation? Anyone can make a movie, and the fact that a movie has a copyright, how does that hurt the internet, for God's sake? And you'll see these kinds of arguments come up again and again in legal discourse, uh, where the very effect of copyright is questioned. Where, where people say we need, we need strong, long copyright protection because it really doesn't have an impact on how communities like Wikipedia function. Uh, so as an economist who studies these questions using data, I figure why not uh, perform a careful analysis of how in one case uh, a copyright has affected a particular community on Wikipedia and show clearly what the effects are and what they're not. Um, so essentially, I want to say this, uh, to steal the words of Larry Lessig, is that because of the opportunity that the internet presents, we've got to rethink the extent of copyright. Uh, and the objective, the objective of this presentation is to provide some data to back up this claim. Um, so this is a copy of Baseball Digest. Uh, I don't know if there are any baseball uh, fans out there, but this is a really popular magazine that has run out since the 1940s, decade by decade. In November 2008, if you wanted to get your hands on one of these, this is the kind of place you would have to go to. Uh, a new stand between, say, 10 AM and 5 PM, and pay $3 in cash and pick up a copy. Uh, in December 2008, you could just go to Google Books. Google Books scanned each and every one of these issues since 1940, um, and they're now just available for you to read. Uh, as a Wikipedia editor, that's great, right? Because now you don't have to find a physical copy uh, that you can cite if you want to cite while editing a copy. Uh, however, so baseball, so this is the timeline of the study. Baseball Digest launches in 1940. However, copyright is applicable only if the issue is published after 1964. Uh, this is a peculiar copyright law that applies to magazines if they're not renewed due to a series of changes. Um, and essentially, everything published by Baseball Digest is in public domain if it's printed between 1940 and 1964. Uh, uh, and 2008 is the year when Baseball Digest becomes available for Wikipedia to use. Uh, so essentially, this is the idea. So these are two guys in a Baseball Digest issue. This guy is Johnny Callison. This guy is Felipe Lou. And this guy's, print, this guy's profile uh, is 
in the 1963 issue of Baseball Digest, which is scanned and available for you to read on Google Books. But the cool thing is, this guy's is too. This guy's copy is available for you to read uh, on Google Books too, except it's under copyright, and you cannot reuse that material on Wikipedia. Uh, so, it's the so the objective of the study is to bring out in numbers sort of this frustrating aspect of being a Wikipedia editor of, hey, that image is out there, that information is out there, but that page has to be devoid of the image and the content. Further, I also look into what effect this has on how much interest editors have in editing these pages in terms of revisions and what the effect is on traffic. Um, so this is the cool graph. So this is the, I study about 1,000 baseball players who played uh, in an all-star game. So these are all big baseball players who have played since 1955 to 1985. So 20 years before and after copyright is applicable. Before Baseball Digest becomes digitized, pages for these players have approximately 0.2 images per page. So one, of, one in five of these guys have an image on their page, and these typically, typically come from fans taking images after they become old. So you're probably going to see an image of Felipe Alou with a paunch when he's 55, <laughs> right? Um, cut to present day. The guys on the right-hand side are the guys, the older guys, the guys who played between 1945 and 1965. So these presumably are the guys who are less, who are more out of fashion. But the, the number of images on these guys' pages is twice that the number of images on the old guys' pages. So the number of images on these pages is going up over time because fans are putting them up. But copyright essentially prevents uh, the reuse of the images of the newer guys uh, and therefore we see this effect. The important underlying thing is that the quality of the underlying content is the same. It's not that the players are worse off. It's not that the players themselves are kind of worse players so there's poor interest. It's purely the effect of copyright. So this gap between these two bars is what copyright does to the quality of Wikipedia. Uh, so next time somebody comes up to you and says, why does this matter? This is one good example of how copyright is essentially infringing uh, our rights um, and our way, the way we make the world's biggest encyclopedia function. So this is the same graph, but over time. So what I do is I plot the difference between the old guys, the new guys and the old guys. So the new guys actually start out with a lead. So the new guys actually have more images. Uh, 2009 is when the digital version of public domain and non-public domain become available, and you see the big jump up. You see that the old guys essentially uh, rise highly in the number of images that they have, and this is, thankly, thank, uh, this is due to the work of about five or six editors on Wiki Project Baseball who discovered uh, these images in public domain and worked really hard to put them up, uh, and even putting them up from, uh, baseball, from a scanned image on Google, uh, Google Books is not easy, but it takes some effort, um, and th uh, about uh, hundreds of these images are now on Wiki Commons. Um, these are the same figures in, in numbers, so pre-digitization, which is pre-Google Books, there were about 0.15 of these images um, on the in-copyright guys and 0.18 on the out-of-copyright guys, so really similar. But today, about one point, there's more than one image per page on the out-of-copyright guys, while the in-copyright guys have only about 60% coverage. Um, these guys are really similar in terms of underlying quality. So I go and study each of these players and see how long did they play for, how long, what is the age at debut, how many all-star games did they play, and these guys are really, really similar. So the differences are not driven by the differences in underlying quality of interest, but they're purely driven by copyright. Um, <coughs> and these are sort of the, so I measure images, is what I talked about. Copyright does not seem to affect character length. So, so I, I interpret this as Wikipedians use a fair use and the ability to sort of, uh, the ability, it's very easy to summarize text, but it's really hard to summarize uh, images, right? So you can, it's really hard to, to use an image without infringing copyright, but you can read an article and summarize it on Wikipedia, and evidence for that shows up in character lens. So there's no difference in the character lens on these two guys' pages. So they both increase 26,000 characters after the digital version becomes available, and there's no difference. But there's a big difference in the images. More importantly, revision seems to go down. So the guys who have copyrights, so revisions, there's a difference about 27 revisions on the in-copyright per month, 
uh, on the in copyright guys versus 16 on the out of copyright guys. So there's about uh, 150% difference in um, the, the out of copyright guys get more editors and more revisions. More importantly, these guys get more traffic. So go, I go and use uh, data from uh, data that's available from 2007 on daily traffic to each of these pages. Um, and thanks to the increased images and thanks to the increased editing, more users actually find this content to be useful. So copyright is not just messing with the ability to reuse some of this content, but also the underlying quality is changing in such a way so that users are discovering this content more and more. Uh, and some of these guys get only one hit per month, uh, and, and an increase of 13 overall oh, as a mean uh, is, is a really large effect in terms of how copyright prevents um, these guys from using this content. Any question? Yeah. Um, how, how, how exactly, I mean, because presumably most people who are not activists in the end would have no knowledge that, that the, um, about copyright and image use. Um, so is it that the articles themselves for the people whose images are out of copyright is a higher quality? Because, or I mean, if you're going to look up a, an individual, you're not going to know ahead of time whether they have pretty pictures or not. So I'm, I'm struggling to grasp how. You mean the connection between copyright and the traffic numbers? Yes. So uh, that's a good question. So my hunch is that it has something to do with Google and how Google maybe like there is evidence out there that shows that if you have thumbnails and if you have certain images, the click-through rate goes up a lot, and images seem to matter for that process. Um, and so I'm actually like working on uh, a revised version where I go and study how the Google ranks of these pages changed with copyright. There's also image search. Right. There's also image search. Yeah. And so I can see how images would drive traffic to these pages because there's no difference in. And the other thing I'm trying to do is understand the quality of the content. So I know the text lengths are the same, but I don't know if it's the same quality. Um, and so there are some of these pages have been tagged by Wikipedia and says good articles, et cetera. And so where the probability of that goes up is something that I'm investigating. Could it be perceived quality? I mean, uh, an article that has an image is perceived as having higher quality than the same without the image? So that's an interesting question. Is I've, I've gotten this question. I've thought about this a lot. And we as Wikipedians care a lot about having images on each of our pages. And the question is why? Why does it matter? Why does like knowing how the guy looks matter to what he did? Or why, why can't we just show statistics? And it seems to matter. And, uh, and this is one evidence that it seems to matter. Uh, I, and I don't know, maybe in the context of baseball players, people are interested in their fans and they want maybe image search, maybe Google. Uh, I don't know what the answer is. Oh, and just to clarify, though, when you're talking about copyright, it's not copyright per se, it's the way we've chosen to, uh, it's our image use policy, which is That's true. restricted. Yeah. You, know, you would be justified in using a copyrighted picture from Baseball Digest if the player was long deceased and it was unlikely that a free image could be. Right. So. One of the objectives of this is to also show how community perceives copyright and how, uh, how users actually implement what they read in copyright law. And Wikipedia is clearly a community that cares deeply about uh, how we think about copyright and having free images. Uh, and people like Jack Valenti need to know that. People out there, lawyers need to know that there are communities out there who care deeply about copyright and that affects how users, like high schoolers, getting into baseball consume this information. And that's presumably an important thing. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is essentially my study. I'm going to go through some more graphs, but, uh, and like there's lots of crap, like there's lots of complicated regressions, et cetera, which I'm not going to bore you with. Um, and essentially, this is, these are sort of the conclusions coming out of this stuff, and then we can have a long discussion, and I'd invite the other uh, speakers, and so we can get combined questions, is that copyright does have a large impact on the use of d digital material, duh. Um, and this is one big example. This impact is particularly salient for images. And one might say, hey, who cares about baseball players, right? Maybe, maybe not the seven million baseball fans out there. But the images apply to maps <coughs> and streets. Uh, images apply to chemical compositions, as someone said yesterday. And this might interfere with the process of how scientists do research. Uh, they, they apply. Uh, to x-ray scans, uh, they apply, and so copyright, 
this is just like scratching the surface of what the impact of copyright is on our society. Um, and I'd be open to suggestions about how I, as an economist, could like apply data to this problem. And if, if any of you know of examples in your own editing history or in your own career or at Wikipedia, or how copyright has impeded your work and how it might have had a real impact, not just on the quality of Wikipedia pages, but also on how people get value out of Wikipedia. Uh, I'd be happy to hear your suggestions. Yeah, you have a question. I, I, I wanted to thank you for your great very insight today. And, and to say that we, um, I work at the Center for Social Media at American University, and, and we've done research with a variety of creative communities where we've done, through long form interviews, asking people about where the intersection is between their creative practice and their understanding of copyright. We've been able to document uh, in, in community after community that the, the overwhelmingly largest effect is in self-censorship. And self-censorship at a very deep level where it's not even that people feel frustrated about not being able to do something. They take off the table what they might be able to do. Right, right. Yeah. Um, actually, I'll wait for the open question. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, so, so that's something that as practitioners of copyright, we need to think about how it applies differentially to different types of content and how people interpret it differently. Um, and in the context of Baseball Digest, this leads to negative outcomes for these players, not just in terms of the number of images, but also they get half the number of edits um, as the other guys. And uh, they have about, <coughs> instead of 13 hits a month, about seven. Um, so just to finish, uh, I'm an economist working on the National Bureau of Economic Research digitization agenda, and we are a bunch of economists interested in how digital economies change how we function as societies. Um, I like to use data to show how IP law, like copyright, affects the process of creative input and creative production, uh, particularly interested for the future in the use of free media and creative commons licenses. So if you want to come talk to me about that, um, et cetera. So thank you so much. Um, um, <laughs>
about like hundred hundreds of hits a, mo a day, and I find similar effects. So I have that covered. Uh, no, I haven't looked into that. So right now it's like focused on the effect of copyright. Sorry. Uh, the back. Yeah, I hear you giving observations. I hear hints at recommendations, but I didn't hear them. Do you, do you have proposals for what could happen to copyright law? Or, or so, so one thing that's clearly coming out of this is sort of the transaction costs. So, so I actually tried writing to Baseball Digest to see if I could license one of the in copyright images. And their office is somewhere in the middle of nowhere. I tried calling their phone. I'm sure they have no problems with Wikipedia using the picture of Johnny Callison. I'm sure like that didn't affect the. So one of the arguments is that copyright enables gives incentives for creation. Is that this stuff would have never been created if Wikipedia could copy it freely? It, it's hard. It, it would be hard pressed to make that argument in this case. So. I don't know. So one suggestion could be just sort of ways in which people could find out about donating their stuff to Wiki Commons or under Creative Commons licenses so that we eliminate sort of the transaction costs of, um, so when people publish their images to have defaults where, uh, they, could, where they could choose more open licenses. Um, because right now there is like no process in which people, so Flickr, for example, has had a big impact on how images are distributed because it at least provides an option for people to use CC licenses. Uh, I think we can have two or three more questions before we finish this session. I personally have been for some time a staunch opponent to allowing fair use content on Wikipedia, um, coming from the perspective of one of about only a dozen users that tries to maintain the 415,000 fair use images. Um, we just can't do a good job. Um, but your, your presentation has made me rethink that a little bit. What do you think the impact would be to article views and article quality if we just up as a community tomorrow decided no right. more fair use forever? Yeah, it would probably be stronger, right? Yeah, because some of these guys, some of the older guys have images and that's under fair use. Um, and so, the, the, the difference would be even more if we became even more strict on, on how we interpreted fair well, use. I mean, the German, the German language Wikipedia does not allow fair use, so it would be very interesting to see their experience. Oh, okay, cool. I should look into that. Yeah, thanks. They don't have great qualified <laughs> 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 Yes, but they do have football. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there's two comments on that. I mean, one is I guess a short term solution would be to someone who works on, ba on going to Baseball Digest and saying, like to donate some of these copyrights, right? And, and you know, raise it. We have done this before. I tried and I had a hard time. Second <laughs> is that there's actually an interesting RFC going on at the moment that sort of touches on this very issue, only in a much more contemporary sense. The question is, should we allow a fair use image of Kim Jong Un? You know, because we're not sure if we're going to be getting a free image because he might not be leaving North Korea for some time, and uh, well, it's not a big tourist stop, and he doesn't make too many public appearances unless someone create a free image. So, yeah, that's you know, a more current version of the same discussion as an active RFC. Yeah, my, I, I understand people have strong emotions on this, but I feel we should, we should entertain more fair use requests of that sort. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, like have a broader sense on what fair use means. Sure, that is it. Okay. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.